the accused Antti Gotovina knew or had reason to know that forces under his effective control were committing the acts described in paragraphs 21 through 26 above, or had done so, including as a result of having been so informed by representatives of the international community. The accused Antigotivina failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent the commission of such acts or punish the perpetrators thereof. By these acts and omissions, the accused Antigotivina did commit count one, a crime against humanity, namely persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds punishable under Article 5H, read with Articles 7-1 and 7-3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Count 2, murder. Between the 4th of August, 1995, and 15th of November, 1995, Croatian forces murdered at least 150 Kraina Serbs by, meaning, by means of shooting, burning, or stabbing. Specifically referred to in this amended indictment are the murders of one person in the Benkovac municipality, 30 persons in the Knin municipality, and one person in the Koranitsa municipality. Listed in the schedule attached here to are further particulars of such murders. Between the 4th of August and the 15th of November, 1995, the accused Antti Gotovina knew or had reason to know that forces under his effective control were about to murder Kraina Serbs as described in paragraph 28 above, or had done so. The accused Antti Gotovina failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent the commission of such acts or punish the perpetrators thereof. By these acts and omissions, the accused Antti Gotovina did commit count two, a violation of the laws of customs of war, namely murder, as recognized by common article 3.1a of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, punishable under Article 3, read with Article 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Count 3, plunder of property. Between the 4th of August and the 15th of November, 1995, Croatian forces systematically plundered the property of the Kraina Serbs, including their homes, outbuildings, barns, and livestock in the towns, villages, and hamlets of the municipalities of Benkovac, Donjilapat, Dernish, Gospic, Grakac, Knin, Koranica, Obravac, Sibenik, Sin, and Zedar. The accused Antti Gotovina acting individually and or in concert with other members of the joint criminal enterprise, planned, instigated, ordered, committed, or otherwise aided and embedded in the planning, preparation, or execution of the acts of plunder of property. Alternatively, the accused Antigotovina knew or had reason to know that forces under his effective control were about to commit the acts described in paragraphs 30 above or had done so. The accused Antigotovina failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent 
the commission of such acts or punish the perpetrators thereof. By these acts and omissions, the accused Antigotevina did commit count three, a violation of the laws or customs of war, namely plunder of public or private property, punishable under Article 3E, read with Articles 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Count 4, wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages. Between 4th of August, 1995, and the 15th of November, 1995, Croatian forces systematically set fire to or otherwise destroyed villages, homes, outbuildings, and barns belonging to Krajina Serbs, killed their livestock, and spoiled their wells. Thousands of dwellings in the municipalities of Benkovac, Donjilapac, Dernish, Gospic, Gračac, Knin, Koranica, Obravac, Šibenik, Sinj, and Zadar were destroyed. The accused Antigotevina, acting individually and or in concert with other members of the joint criminal enterprise, planned, instigated, ordered, committed, or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning, preparation, or execution of the acts of destruction of property. Alternatively, the accused, Antigotevina, knew or had reason to know that forces under his effective control or subordinate to him were about to commit the acts described in paragraph 33 above or had done so. The accused, Antigotevina, failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent the commission of such acts or punish the perpetrators thereof. By these acts and omissions, the accused Antigotevina did commit count four, a violation of the laws or custom of war, namely wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages, punishable under Article 3B read with Articles 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Counts 5 and 6, Deportation and Forced Displacement. Between the 4th of August, 1995 and 15th of November, 1995, Croatian forces directed violent and intimidating acts against Krajina Serbs, including the plunder and destruction of their property, thereby forcing them to flee the southern portion of the Krajina region. These acts were intended to discourage or prevent those who had already fled the area, either immediately before or during Operation Storm, in anticipation of an armed conflict from returning to their homes. The effect of these violent and intimidating act, acts was the deportation and or displacement of tens of thousands of Krajina Serbs to Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia. The accused Antigotevina, acting individually and or in concert with others, including Ivan Chermak, Miladin Markic, and President Franjo Tujman, planned, instigated, ordered, committed, or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning, preparation, or execution of the deportation and forced displacement of the Krajina Serb population. Alternatively, 
The accused Antigotivina knew or had reason to know that forces under his effective control were about to commit the acts described in paragraph 36 and 37 above or had done so. <laughs> the accused Antigotivina failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent the commission of such acts or punish the perpetrators thereof. By these acts and omissions, the accused Antigotavina did commit count five, a crime against humanity, namely deportation <coughs> published under article, punishable under Article 5, D, read with Article 7, 1, and 7, 3 of the statute of the tribunal. Count six, a crime against humanity, namely other inhumane acts, forced displacement, punishable under Article 5I, read with Article 7.1 and 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Count 7, Other Inhumane Acts. Between the 4th of August 1995 and the 15th of November 1995, Croatian forces subjected many of the Kraina Serbs to inhumane treatment, humiliation, and degradation by beating and assaulting them. Between the 4th of August 1995 and 15th of November 1995, the accused Antigotovina knew or had reason to know that forces under his effective control were about to commit the acts described in paragraph 40 above, or had done so. The accused Antigotovina failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent the commission of such acts or punish the perpetrators thereof. By these acts and omissions, the accused Antigotovina did commit count seven, a crime against humanity, namely other inhumane acts, punishable under Article 5I, read with Article 7.3 of the Statute of the Tribunal. Statement of the Facts. The Republic of Croatia declared its independence on the 25th of June 1991, by which time an armed conflict had erupted in some areas in Croatia between Croatian Serbs, Kraina Serbs, and Croatian forces. In September 1991, the Croatian Serbs and the Yugoslav People's Army, the JNA, controlled about one-third of the territory of the Republic of Croatia. On the 19th of December, 1991, the Assembly of the Serbian Autonomous Region of Kraina, together with the Serbs from other parts of the Republic of Croatia, declared independence from Croatia and purported to form a new entity, the self-proclaimed Republic Republika Srpska Krajina, the RSK. The RSK had its own military force, the Serbian Army of Krajina, or SVK. The Krajina region, comprising the former UNPA's Sector South and Sector North, was situated within the RSK and included, but was not limited to, the municipalities of Benkovac, Donji Lapac, Drenis, Gospic, Grakac, Knin, Koranica, Obravat, Šibenik, Sin, and Zedar. In February 1992, in accordance with the Vance Plan, the United Na Nations Secretary Security Council established under its authority a United Nations protection force called UMPROFOR that was to be deployed 
in the UN PAs in Croatia. The UN PAs were areas in Croatia where Serbs constituted the majority or a, subs or a substantial minority of the population and where, where intercommunal tensions had already led to armed conflict. There were four UMPAs, known as Sector North, South, East, and West. By 1992, the Croatian Army was formulating plans for the forcible retaking of the territory of the RSK. In 1992, 1993, 1994, and 1995, Croatian forces launched military operations with this object ultimate objective. These operations were launched into the UNPA's or adjacent pink zones in the Milachevi Plateau in June 1992, the area of the Meslanita Bridge in northern Dalmatia in January 1993 the Medak Pocket in September 1993, Operation Flash in Western Slovenia, May 1995. Slavo Slavonia, not Slovenia. Slavonia, excuse me. In Western Slavonia in May 1995, and Operation Storm in August 1995. Ivan Chermak was born on 19th of September, 19th of December, 1949, and the municipality of Zagreb in the Republic of Croatia, then part of the SFRI. Between 1990 and 1991, Ivan Chermak held the position of Vice President of the Executive Board of the Croatian Democratic Union, HDZ, and also served as an advisor to President Franjo Tuđman. In 1991, Ivan Chermak was appointed the Assistant Minister, Minister of Defense in the Government of the Republic of Croatia, which position he held until 1993. Whilst in this position and thereafter, he held the rank of Colonel General. In 1993, he was appointed the Minister of Trade, Shipbuilding and Energy. In December 1993, Ivan Chermak ceased to be Minister of the Croatian Government. On the 5th of August 1995, President Franjo Tuđman appointed Ivan Chermak the commander of the Knin garrison. Ivan Chermak established his headquarters in Knin on 5th or 6th of August 1995. As the commander of the Knin garrison and pursuant to the authority conferred on him by President Franjo Tuđman, to whom he was re directly respons responsible, Ivan Chermak exercised de jure and or de facto control over some of the Croatian forces operating in the southern portion of the Kraina region during Operation Storm from the time of his appointment and in the operations aftermath. In particular, he exercised effective control over the units of the Special Police of the Ministry of Interior of the Republic of Croatia, the RH MUP, and some elements of the HV, including the military police and civil administration, and through them exercised territorial control over significant areas in which the crime alleged in this amended indictment were committed. On or about the 15th of November, 1995, Ivan Chermak was succeeded as the commander of Knin Garrison by his deputy. Maladin Market was born on the, 5th, on the 8th of May, 1955, and Dur Durdevac in the municipality of Durdevac in the Republic of Croatia, then part of the SFRI. 
In 1981, Mladen Markic graduated from the University of Zagreb, and in 1982, he completed his compulsory military service. He then joined the police force of the Ministry of Interior of the SFRI. In 1990, Mladen Markic and others established a police unit for special tasks within the Ministry of the Interior. He was appointed deputy commander of the unit, which in late 1990 became the anti-terrorist unit. In 1991, Maladin Markic was appointed the head of the Lucho Anti-Terrorist Unit. In 1992, he was promoted to the rank of Major General Reserve. On the 18th of February, 1994, Maladin Markic was appointed commander of the RH MUP. In the aftermath of Operation Storm, Maladin Markic held the rank of Colonel General. As commander of the special police of the RH MUP, during and after Operation Storm, Mladen Markic deployed and issued orders to the special police forces and otherwise exercised control over them. I thank you, Madam Registrar. I will uh, relieve you when it comes to uh, the schedule, and I want to make uh, sure that I am right in this. Uh, Attached to uh, the amended indictment, there is only one schedule, uh, Mr. Whiting. Uh, is that correct? Initially, in the, in the original indictment, there were two. And what we have now with the amended indictment is just one schedule referring to counts two and three. And it is a uh, revised uh, list of uh, victims. And we don't have what was the other schedule relating to counts four and five. Um, that's correct, Your Honor. And while I'm on my feet, if I could just make one um, clarification to Your Honor's very helpful procedural summary of the original indictment and, and this uh, amended indictment. Uh, just to be clear, the original indictment was in fact unsealed and made public on July 26, 2001. Um, so the, there has in fact been a public indictment against this accused for over four years. Right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, I will deal myself with the schedule to this, in, uh, to this uh, amended indictment. And the reason why I'm going into the details is that this is a special tribunal that uh, attaches great importance to the role that uh, victims uh, play uh, in, in these proceedings. Uh, this tribunal also has uh, a mandate from the Security Council of the United Nations uh, to strive uh, towards uh, a, a reconciliation uh, on the ground uh, in the territories of the former Yugoslavia. And so we consider it important that uh, the uh, families of uh, these alleged uh, victims uh, are aware that they have not been uh, forgotten uh, by this tribunal. This is a schedule to the in amended indictment referring to counts two and three, and it deals with uh, several uh, uh, um, villages and hamlets. Uh, I will go through the list very um, uh, quickly. Um, uh, it uh, gives the uh, uh, municipality hamlet or village the date uh, when the uh, um, uh, killing uh, took place, uh, the victim's name, um, uh, the uh, sex or gender, I prefer to use that word, the age when it is available, and the manner of death. I'll start with uh, the uh, Benkovac uh, municipality, uh, village of Kakma, 9th August 1995, an uh, unidentified male victim uh, was uh, killed by gunshot. In the Knin municipality, in the village of Durich, uh, on or about the 6th of August of 1995, uh, Sava Durich, a male, uh, killed by gunshot. In Sarena Yezera, on the 5th of August 1995, Milos uh, Borian, a male, 
killed by gunshot. And then six unidentified males, all killed on the same day by gunshot. In Zag uh, Zagrovich, uh, on a date between the 5th and the 12th of August of 1995, Milka uh, Petko, a female, aged 70, she was killed by gunshot. Uh, Ilya Petko, a male, aged 45, killed by gunshot. Uh, Dimitar Rashuo, a male, aged 81, killed by gunshot. Juro Rashuo, a male, uh, aged 40, killed by gunshot. And an unidentified person uh, of an unknown uh, gender, um, uh, killed by gunshot. In the village of Uchdolie, on the 6th of August 1995, uh, the persons that I have, I will be mentioning were all killed by gunshot. Milica Sare, a female. Stevo Beric, a male, aged 62. Jania Beric, a female, aged 62. Milos Chosic, Chosic a male, uh, age unknown. Yandria Share, a female. Juka Beric, a female, and Krista Sare, a female. Juka Beric was aged 75 when she was killed by gunshot. Uh, in Kakanie, on a date between the 10th and the 18th of August 1995, uh, Danika uh, Saric, a female. Uros Saric, a male, killed by gunshot. And Uros Ognienovic, a male, also killed by uh, gunshot. Uh, in Orlich, on or about the 13th of August 1995, Tode Maric, a male, killed by gunshot. Uh, in Oton, on the 18th of August 1995, a certain Marta Vujonic, a female, aged 85, killed by gunshot. Uh, at Grubori, on the 25th of August 1995, Milos Gruber, Grubor, a male aged 80, uh, killed by gunshot. Jovo Grubor, another male aged 65, uh, killed by gunshot and have had uh, his throat cut. A certain Maria Grubor, female aged 90, she was burnt. Uh, Mika Grubor, a female aged 50, 51, she was killed by gunshot. And finally, Juro uh, Karanovic, a male, aged 45, he was beaten and killed by gunshot. In Korenica municipality, uh, Komic, uh, 12th August 1995, a certain Mara Ugarkovic, uh, female, uh, aged 74, killed by gunshot. So, uh, Mr. Gotovina, uh, please stand up. You have the following uh, options uh, today. You may opt, as I ask you whether you wish to enter a plea, you may opt to plead guilty or not guilty uh, to the seven counts that were read out today. You also have uh, the right, if you want to, if you so choose, to delay pleading. In that case, uh, pleading has to come forward, or I can delay it only up to 30 days uh, from, uh, from, from, from today. You also have a right to remain completely silent. And if you remain completely silent in 30 days' time from today, if you still remain silent, then I will enter a plea of not guilty on your behalf to each of the seven accounts that were read out. Uh, I wish to know whether you have had an opportunity to discuss uh, this with uh, your duty counsel and whether you are prepared to enter a plea uh, today, or whether you wish to delay or you wish to remain silent. Mr. 
účastní súdy. Your Honor, I have discussed this with my counsel and I am prepared to plead today. Uh, I thank you. Um, uh, the first account that you are charged with, and you've heard uh, Madame Register, Registrar reading uh, it together with the other counts, is a charge of uh, persecutions, a crime against humanity, which uh, under the statute of this tribunal is punishable under Article 5H. You were charged uh, with persecutions, uh, both uh, with individual criminal responsibility pursuant to Article 7.1 of the statute, as well as uh, under superior command responsibility pursuant to Article 7.3 of the statute. How do you plead to this uh, first count of persecution, guilty or not guilty? Your Honor, not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Gotovina. The second count is a charge of murder, uh, which is a violation of uh, the laws or customs of war, which is punishable under Article 3 of the statute of this tribunal. Uh, as uh, regards this second count of murder, you are charged with superior responsibility pursuant to Article 7.3 of the statute. How do you plead uh, to this second count of murder being a violation of the laws and customs of war? Not guilty, Your Honor. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Gotovina. The third count is a charge of plunder of public or private property, this being a violation of the laws or customs of war, uh, also punishable under Article 3E of the statute of this tribunal. Uh, as far as this count is concerned, you are charged both under 7.1, that is individual uh, criminal responsibility, uh, and uh, under 7.3, that is uh, by way of superior command responsibility. Uh, how do you wish to plead to this uh, third count? Uh, guilty or not guilty? Trust me, not guilty, Your Honor. I thank you, Mr. Gotovina. The fourth count you're charged with is, as you've heard, a charge of wanton destruction of city towns or villages, this being a violation of the laws or customs of war, also punishable under Article 3B of the Statute of this Tribunal. You are charged as, uh, with regard to this uh, fourth count, both under 7.1, Article 7.1 and Article 7.3 of uh, the, our statute, that is both uh, under individual criminal responsibility and under superior command responsibility. How do you plead to this uh, fourth count against you? Your Honor, not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Gotovina. The fifth count uh, relates uh, to a charge of deportation, this being a crime against humanity, which is punishable under Article 5D of the statute of this tribunal. Uh, even here, with regard to this uh, fifth count, uh, charge of deportation, you're charged both under Article 7.1 and Article 7.3 of the statute, that is by way of individual criminal responsibility as well as by way of superior uh, responsibility. How do you wish to plead to this fifth count uh, against you, namely one of deportation, a crime against humanity? Trust me, Sudan. Your Honor, not guilty. Thank you. A sixth count is uh, a charge of other inhumane acts uh, consisting uh, of enforced displacement, displacement. Uh, this being also a crime against humanity, punishable under Article 5.1i of the Statute of this Tribunal. You are charged uh, with this uh, crime both uh, with individual criminal responsibility pursuant to Article 7.1 of this Tribunal, uh, as uh, art of the Statute of this Tribunal, as well under uh, Article 7.3, that is, with cr superior uh, command responsibility. How do you wish to plead to this sixth count of other inhumane acts being a crime against humanity? Guilty or not guilty? Trust me, Your Honor, not guilty.
Thank you. And the seventh and final count is a charge of other inhumane acts, a crime against humanity, punishable also under Article 5I of the statute. You're charged uh, with superior responsibility in this context pursuant to Article 73 of the statute. How do you wish to plead to this seventh and final count, guilty or not guilty? Your Honor, not guilty. Okay, you may uh, sit down. Thank you. Madam Registrar, I wish you to uh, enter into uh, the records of this case and note to the effect that the accused, uh, upon being asked uh, by the presiding judge, has entered a plea of not guilty uh, to each and every one of the seven counts uh, brought against him by the amended indictment. Yes, Your Honor. Um, uh, Mr. Gotovina, it is also my duty pursuant to uh, Rule uh, 62 bis of, the, of our uh, Rules of Procedure and Evidence that should you uh, so wish uh, uh, at any uh, later point in time, you can uh, change your plea uh, uh, from one of not guilty to uh, one of uh, guilty in relation uh, to either the entirety of uh, the indictment or to uh, one or more of the counts that were read out to you. Um, having said uh, all this, now I will uh, uh, quickly uh, bring this uh, uh, initial appearance to an end by uh, uh, pointing out uh, the following. Um, uh, I will now proceed uh, to appoint a pretrial judge uh, for your case, um, uh, and the pretrial judge, which could be myself, uh, will schedule a status uh, conference to be held within uh, the next 120 days uh, from today. Uh, this will be pursuant to Rule 65 uh, bis A of the uh, Rules of Procedure and Evidence of this Tribunal. The purpose of such status conference is twofold. Uh, first of all, it will uh, give uh, the pre uh, the pretrial judge and also the pretrial chamber an opportunity to organize exchanges between the parties, prosecution and defense, and to uh, uh, facilitate and put in motion uh, the, uh, an expeditious uh, preparation for trial. Uh, secondly, um, the pre-trial judge will have an opportunity uh, to uh, see you in person uh, and uh, make sure that um, you, your rights are being fully respected, that you are being uh, treated well uh, by uh, the uh, uh, by our personnel and the, the uh, detention unit, as well as by uh, your counsel, uh, and to uh, be made aware of any complaints and requests that uh, you may have. Uh, later on, you will be informed of the exact date uh, of the status conference in, in due course. But as a newcomer uh, to this tribunal, may I uh, point out that uh, we take pride in having uh, a detention unit, uh, which is a model uh, in uh, so far as respect uh, of of detainees uh, rights uh, are concerned and you will have an opportunity uh, to see for yourself and to to to, to assess for yourself uh, the the uh, uh, precision uh, with which i am addressing this uh, matter i will also be giving instructions to the registrar uh, Mr. Holthaus, uh, to fix a date uh, for trial when uh, this becomes appropriate. Of course, between now and when a date, a fixed date is fixed, is, a, is, is established, uh, there will be uh, the pre-trial uh, process uh, in place, and much depends on how quickly uh, the pre-trial stage will proceed. In the meantime, uh, until there is an order to the contrary, uh, you will remain in uh, custody 
uh, pursuant to an order that I signed earlier on this morning. But as I explained to you earlier on, uh, Rule 65 uh, does entitle you to file a motion for provisional uh, release. Uh, I am sure that uh, counsel uh, that will be assigned to you uh, will help you uh, uh, in, in, the, in this matter. I also wish to uh, draw your attention to uh, uh, another rule uh, uh, that we have that is rarely referred to in, in, in initial appearances, and that is that uh, there is nothing stopping the uh, prosecutor from uh, seeking uh, to question you, uh, even at this stage after your uh, arraignment before this, uh, uh, before me today. Uh, Rule 63 uh, governs uh, this matter, and I'm going to read it out to you so that you will be uh, privy to the uh, rights that you have should you be approached by a member of, from the Office of the Prosecutor uh, uh, seeking, seeking an interview with you. The first paragraph of Rule 63 uh, lays down that questioning by the prosecutor of an accused including after the initial appearance, that is, including even after today, shall not proceed without the presence of counsel unless the accused has voluntarily and expressly agreed to proceed without counsel present. If the accused subsequently expresses a desire to have counsel, questioning shall thereupon cease and shall only resume when the accused's counsel is present. The questioning, this is paragraph B now, the questioning, including any waiver of the uh, right to counsel, shall be audio recorded or video recorded in accordance with the procedure provided for in another rule, that's rule uh, 4 to 3. And the prosecutor shall, at the beginning of the questioning, caution the accused in accordance with Rule 42A3. Uh, basically, I will be uh, <coughs> brief here. The uh, uh, prosecutor or the officer from the Office of the Prosecutor would be bound to caution you first and foremost as to your right to remain silent and that uh, any statement that uh, you may uh, decide to make uh, will be recorded and may be used in evidence. I would suggest uh, that you ask the uh, um, uh, officer in charge at the detention unit uh, to ask the registrar to make available uh, to you a copy of the rules of procedure and evidence as well as of the statute uh, in your own language. They exist, they are available, and uh, I think they would help you um, understand better a uh, bit of our uh, procedural rules. Um, I also wish to avail myself of this initial appearance uh, to re remind uh, you, Mr. Whiting, uh, for and on behalf the prosecutor, that pursuant to uh, Rule 66A1 of uh, our rules, um, uh, you uh, need to make available uh, to uh, Defence Council in a language uh, which the accused understands uh, all the supporting material which accompanied the indictment when confirmation was sought. And this needs to be uh, done within 30 days of the initial appearance, that is, of today. I do appreciate, of course, that uh, today we only have a duty council uh, and that we, strictly speaking, do not have um, uh, a proper defense council yet uh, assigned, but I think that would be something that should materialize in the next uh, few days. Um, uh, Mr. Gotovina, um, also related to uh, what I have just uh, mentioned to the uh, prosecutor, uh, you uh, and uh, your defense counsel, um, uh, in accordance with uh, our Rule 72A, uh, you will have then a 30-day period for filing a, any preliminary motions 
uh, that uh, once you would have received all the supporting material in accordance with uh, Rule 66 that I mentioned uh, a, a minute ago. Um, uh, I entrust that uh, matters are already on the way to uh, uh, start uh, discussions with you uh, regarding the uh, assignment of uh, Defence Council for the purpose of the pre-trial stage, and I am sure that uh, your Defence Council will take um, uh, this uh, matter up. If, in the meantime, uh, until you are assigned a proper defense counsel, uh, you need uh, some legal advice. I can uh, refer you to the uh, uh, commandant of uh, the uh, uh, detention unit or directly to the registrar or his deputy. I can assure you they, you will find them very forthcoming and they will assist you with any request that you might have. Before I uh, bring this initial uh, appearance to uh, an end, is there anything, uh, Mr. Whiting, that you would like to raise at this stage on behalf of the uh, prosecution? Uh, no, Your Honor, except to say that um, the, the, uh, the OTP is well aware of its disclosure obligations um, and will seek to disclose the supporting materials um, promptly. Yes, I uh, thank you so much, and uh, needless to say, uh, this needs to be the Rule 66 disclosure needs to be in a language that uh, the accused understands. Uh, uh, Mr. Gotovina, um, uh, you will soon leave this courtroom. Uh, you've been here only a few days. Uh, I wish to know whether you, from you whether you wish to raise any matter. I also wish uh, to, to know whether in these uh, days uh, following your um, uh, arrest and, and, and uh, surrender and transfer to The Hague, whether you have been treated uh, well and if you have uh, any matter that you would uh, like me to, addre to address to me, please uh, go ahead. Your Honor, no, I do not have anything to raise. Everything is uh, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You may sit down. There being no other uh, business to transact, no other matters to, uh, to address, uh, I declare this uh, initial appearance uh, ended here. Thank you. All rise.